Welcome to Temple Talks. This is Yitzhak Ruven speaking to you from south of Jerusalem here in the holy and beautiful land of Israel. Today is the 14th day of the month of Tivet, 5784. It's the 25th of December, 2023. This coming Shabbat we read Parashat Vayechi, the final Torah reading of the book of Genesis, which begins in the book of Genesis, chapter 47, verse 28, and concludes chapter 50, verse 26. And what an adventure it's been, this adventure odyssey known as the book of Genesis. We read it every year, year after year after year, and every year there's something new to glean, some some new insight, something that never dawned on us before that we either saw for the first time or heard from somebody else and wow all of a sudden it all makes sense a whole new perspective a whole new depth of understanding it happens every year to everyone and anyone who simply puts the time in and reads the parsha and of course the more time you put in the more your reward will be and if you have the ability to study it in Hebrew or to have someone who can help you with the Hebrew to glean, to gain and glean even greater insights, that's all the better. Uh, last week, if you recall, I spent a long time talking about uh, the situation here in Israel, the war, etc., and uh, we had very little time to talk about last week's parsha, which is really, in a way, the climactic parsha of the entire book of Genesis, and that was parashat Vayigash, where Yosef and um, his brothers um, have a bit of a showdown um, over Binyamin, the fate of Binyamin. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about that and this week's Parsha at length. Um, I'm not going to say much about this week about the war effort here in Israel, except that it continues. Israel continues to push forward in Gaza and um, paying a very heavy price for our efforts. We've lost many soldiers, dear, dear, dear soldiers. Every soldier is precious. Every soldier is a son, uh, a brother, uh, a father. Um, and uh, it's very painful to to uh, hear the news each morning. And uh, whether it's uh, one or two or more soldiers have fallen over the past 24 hours in battle. It's very, very difficult, but the people are united and our task lays before us and we really have no choice. We've been given no choice but to completely eradicate Hamas. We cannot live with uh, neighbors such as they are. And um, that's, that's where we're heading, to the complete eradication of Hamas. And again, we hopefully will uh, will be victorious in battle sooner rather than later, but uh, the ultimate process will 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 take time because even once the the war has ended, there will be pockets of resistance and also an entire people, entire population that needs to be re-educated, um, to be deprogrammed from the cult death the death the, the the cult that puts death uh, as a value greater than life which uh, just cannot be tolerated cannot be abided by for all of us who value life uh, more than death so speaking of that this this week's parsha is vayechi which means and he lived and it's referring to Yaakov, Jacob, who lived in Egypt for 17 years after he went there to reunite, reunite with his son, Yosef. And um, interesting, because there's another parsha in the book of Genesis that's called... Uh, um, that's called... Uh, what is it called? I don't want to... I'm just forgetting for the moment. Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah. Right, and the life of Sarah begins with her death. It's all about her death and burial, but it's called the life of Sarah. And Parshat Vayechi uh, opens with Yaakov. Um, 
He is 147 years old. In just a minute, we'll read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English. And he, the day of his passing is approaching, and he knows it. So, very interestingly, both these two different Torah portions um, have the word chai, life in them, uh, in the title, but they're both about death. And uh, there is a, a saying among our sages that... Uh, person who lives a good life, who lives uh, by the Torah, who, who leaves something of, of value behind him is alive. That person is alive. Whereas a person who uh, leads a life of no value, doesn't give, doesn't uh, add anything to, to his surroundings, is, a, is a, a person who is dead. They're like a walking dead. Uh, because really the the, the definition of life is that we can give. We can give of ourselves. We can share. We can relate to others and, and, and be part of something bigger than ourselves. So both of these, parsha, Parshiot, Chayei uh, Sarah and Vayechi, are tributes, as well as stories, as well as part of the narrative, but they're tributes to the lives of uh, the matriarch Sarah and the patriarch Yaakov. Uh, who lived and continue to live in their children to this very day. Let's read the first few verses of Vayechi in Hebrew, then in English. Again, it begins the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 47, verse 28. And that's where we're at right now. Vayehi Yaakov be'eretz Mitzrayim shva esrei shana, vayehi yemei Yaakov shnei chayav sheva shanim v'arabaim u'ma'at shana. Vayikrovu yemei Yisrael lamut, vayikra livno liyosef, vayomelo im lo im na matzati hain be'enecha, simna yanecha tachat yirechi, v'asita imadi hesed ve'emet al na tikbreni be'mitzrayim. Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and the days of Yaakov, the years of his life, were 147 years. The time approached for Israel to die, so he called for his son, for Yosef, and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, please place your hand under my thigh and do kindness and truth with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, for I will lie down with my fathers, and you shall transport me out of Egypt and bury me in their tomb. He said, I personally will do as you have said. So we open up this parsha after last week's uh, reunification of the family of Yaakov and his 12 sons. Very joyful, um, very poignant, and yet there is sort of a, a back, a background, a, a, an atmosphere, a, a gathering atmosphere in the background of of sadness, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But here, uh, after all that joyful reunification, after all those years, uh, the time has come, Yaakov's days are, are his end of his days are approaching, and he has things to, uh, matters to take care of before he dies. And the first thing on his mind is that he will not be buried in Egypt. He does not want to stay there. He wants to be buried with his fathers, and mothers in uh, the Machpelah, in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. And uh, so, of course, as we know, uh, in the continuation of Parshat Vayechi, that's exactly what happens after he dies. He is actually uh, embalmed, as was the Egyptian c custom, and he was mourned for 70 days in Egypt. And then Yosef and his brother and their families um, and many of uh, Pharaoh's uh, people um, uh, brought uh, Yaakov's body for burial in Machpelah and then went back down to Egypt. So he has Yosef swear that uh, he will make sure that he's buried in Egypt, and I'm sorry, in the Machpelah, in the land of Israel, and not in Egypt. In fact, after, just jumping ahead a bit, after he gives blessing to all of his 12 sons, um, um, after all that, and again, he gives all of them instruction now, after he initially um, gave instruction to Yosef that he should be buried in the Machpelah, and after that he met with Yosef a second time when it was really time, his, his, 
his time had really come, and he blessed his two sons, uh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And now he blesses all 12 of his sons. And after the blessings of 12 sons, it says, And when Yaakov finished instructing his sons, he drew his feet onto the bed. He expired and was gathered to his people. Um, and uh, I just want to see what that's, how that is in Hebrew. Um, Vayasof Ragalov. And he gathered his feet onto the onto his bed. Now, why am I pointing this out? I just find it very. I'm not sure if this expression exists elsewhere in the entire Torah. I don't think it ex it exists anywhere else in the book of Genesis that he lifted up his feet and and drew them into onto the bed and, and then died. Um, but I could be wrong, and I don't know if it's it's an expression used anywhere else in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scripture, but I find it very, very uh, interesting that it's used here. To me, it's as if he's saying, I want to get out of Egypt as fast as possible. When I, I'm dying and I'm already lifting up my feet, I'm already on my way, I want to sever the connection. As we know, he was terrified to go down into Egypt, even though he was going to reunite, knew he was going to reunite with his son Yosef, and that uh, Hashem uh, came to him in a night vision uh, in Be'er Sheva on the way down to Egypt, and that uh, he said, "Don't be afraid. It's all according to my plan. You're going to be in Egypt, and your children will leave Egypt, a great nation." But uh, he wants to get out of Egypt ASAP, and so. The last thing, the very last thing he does is to lift up his feet with his last ounce of strength and draw them into his bed so that uh, he was minutak, he was disconnected from the land that was Egypt, ready, as it were, to be brought to his final resting place in the Machpelah, in the cave of the Machpelah, in Hebron, in Canaan, the land of Israel. So... That is that. But let's go back again to last week's parasha when, as we know from the conclusion of two weeks ago, me kids, that uh, Yosef, the second time the brothers have come down to Egypt to get more food, they bring their youngest brother, Benjamin, Benjamin, uh, according to Yosef's uh, instructions, you can't return for more food unless you bring your youngest son. And much to uh, the chagrin of Yaakov, they brought him. He sort of had no choice but to agree because they needed the food. But the uh, Yehuda swore that he would see to the safety and the safe return of Binyamin. And then as they're leaving Egypt, after they got a great welcome from Yosef, again, they still don't know who Yosef is, but they got this great welcome. They had a meal together. He's very nice to them. He sends them off. And then he sends people on the way to to uh, stop them and of course he has planted he has one of his servants plant his silver goblet in the knapsack of Binyamin and when they discover it uh, Binyamin is accused of stealing it and Yosef says he's going to keep him as his slave the other brothers can go back and then of course in the beginning of last week's parasha Vayigash which means uh, Vayigash Yehuda and Yehuda drew close they approached um, Yosef, and it's an expression sometimes used in battle in the Torah. Vayigash drew close, and he says, uh -uh, "It can't happen. I'm not going to go through his entire beautiful uh, speech to Yosef." But he said, "This can't happen. I told my father that I was going to see to his safe return, and." Uh, you know, he already lost one brother, and uh, if uh, Benjamin is not returned with us, it will, it will cost my father his life. He will not be able to go on. It's a very, very beautiful uh, plea, speech. However, uh, our sages also interpret it as not simply being, please, you can't like, make this happen, but this ain't going to happen. This is not going to happen in no way. Uh, you're going to back down or there's going to be trouble, right? There's this, and, and it's 
in the words if you read them carefully also. He, even though he's being very polite and very proper, he's speaking to the second in command of the most powerful nation on earth, but he's being very, very direct and very straight and saying this can't happen. He has to come back. I have guaranteed that he will return to his father. So, of course, when Yosef understands this, uh, that's when he can't hold himself back anymore. He orders all the Egyptians out of the room and he begins to cry and he reveals his true identity to his brothers. And why now? Because this is the moment he's been waiting for. They have proven that what they did to, y to Yosef all those years before, they are not going to do again. They learned their lesson. They have been expressing their regret all along, if you recall. They've been talking amongst themselves, not realizing that Yosef understands uh, their language, Hebrew. That, you know, we did this, we, we, were, we were bad to our little brother, we didn't listen to him when he was, ple when he was pleading with us, crying out for us to, to save him, uh, and now it's come back to haunt us. Okay, that was part one of what we call in Hebrew tshuva, which is tshuva, which is to repent. But repent is sort of a, a, a flat word for teshuva. Teshuva means a few things. It means A, recognizing that you've done something wrong. B, showing remorse, feeling real remorse for what you've done. And C, owning up to the person who you need to make uh, amends with, owning up to what you've done, asking for, for, for their forgiveness. And D, being certain that you're never going to do this thing again. And to be certain you're never going to do this thing again uh, ultimately means uh, you never really know unless you're tested. Unless the thing you did once, that same situation returns and you resist doing it again, then you have truly, ultimately repented. And here they are. They've actually completed all four of these stages of teshuva. Um, and because his final stage is they could have said, okay, keep your, keep Binyamin, you know, well, whatever. Uh, we got rid of Yosef, we can get you to rid of Binyamin. No. They said, basically, you would have said over my dead body. And again, our Midrash says that they're ready to, he sent out a signal to his brothers. Uh, if this guy, if this guy, this second in command to Pharaoh, uh, doesn't give us our brother back, then we're taking out our swords and we're taking down all of Egypt. Um, they were ready to fight for their brother's safe return to their father. And so that's the final stage of Teshuvah. That's what Yosef was waiting for. And now he reveals his identity to them. They're sh stunned, of course, shocked. They don't know what to say. And he says, it's all good. Basically, he says, it's all good. This was all God's plan for you to come down here because here's the food I can provide. I can provide for you all. I can make sure you all have food. Now, get back on your on your donkeys. Go back to your father and bring him back. I want to see my father. Um, so we have this wonderful, wonderful uh, conclusion to this very, very, very tragic story. And again, it's not just the conclusion to the story of Yosef and his, fa and his brothers, it's also a bit of a conclusion to the entire book of Genesis. Because if we recall, way back when, the first set of brothers, the, first, the second generation of mankind after Adam and Eve were Cain and Abel. And there seemed to be some kind of a rivalry between them, similar, perhaps, a jealousy, similar very much so to the jealousy and rivalry that seemed to exist between Yosef and his brothers. And in fact, if you read the story of Cain and Abel very carefully and read uh, at the same time the story of Yosef and his brothers, there's a lot of, of um, com commonality. Um, the, you know, Cain... When his when his when his face is fallen, when he's heartbroken, crestfallen because his because his uh, offering wasn't accepted by Hashem, Hashem says to him, "You, you know, you're tempted to do bad, but but you must rule over it. You must rule over your urge to do bad." 
And that, that expression rule over is repeated when the brothers say, when Yosef has his dream way back as a young man, as a child, they said, do you mean that you're going to really rule over us? And then, of course, there's there's Hashem asking Cain, where's, where's Abel, your brother? And then there's Yosef saying, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my brothers. And am I my brother's keeper? And Yosef says, in fact, the uh, am I my brother's keeper is uh, am I my brother's keeper? The word anochi is rarely used for, for the word me, I. Am I my brother's keeper, anochi? It's usually ani. But that same word, anochi, is used when Yosef is looking for his brothers when he tells the man in the field, my anochi uh, uh, I'm looking for my brothers. There's so many similarities. Uh, He's, Yosef is looking for his brothers. He's in the field looking for his brothers. Cain uh, 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 kills his brother in the field. Um, and uh, etc., etc. It's really uncanny, the, the similarities. And in the case of Cain and Abel, of course, Cain killed his brother. And all, ever since then, all throughout the book of, of Genesis, we see there, throughout the generations of man, there's this recurring brother brotherly rivalry. I mean, Esau swore to kill Yaakov. He didn't, but it came close again. And as far as Hashem's concerned, uh, mankind, he's, he has made a covenant with Avraham, and that covenant has been kept throughout, you know, Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov, the three generations, and now it's the fourth generation after after Avraham. And... Um, Hashem has plans to make a, a great nation out of these brothers and uh, through that great nation to to make Hashem's presence, His name known to all the world. Hashem has great plans, great expectations, but it's all on the shoulders of these 12 brothers right now. And this recurring brotherly rivalry, this this animosity between brothers has to end. And that's why Hashem oversaw conducted from behind behind the curtains uh, privately as it were this whole story of Yosef and his brothers they had to work this through and for the first time that we see it recorded in the book of Genesis this process of teshuva of tshuva has has happened now our, our sages tell us that tshuva was one of the things that was created even before Bereshit, even before in the beginning, because the world cannot exist without man's ability to overcome himself, to overcome his own evil urges, to overcome what he's done, to make amends, to, to move on, to better himself, to make peace with his brother. That's essential for, not just for humanity, but for for, for for all of a creation. Man has to be able to do that. That's always been there. It's been latent till now. Uh, Cain and Abel clearly didn't do it. Uh, Ishmael and and and, uh, and Yitzhak, it's not recorded that they did it, nor is it recorded, even though there was uh, some kind of a reconciliation, it seems, between Yaakov and, and Esau. There was no, there was never any formal, proper uh, process of tshuva, uh, from either of them. Maybe they both needed to do it, but now we hear for the first time we witness Tshuva. The brothers have, have come clean. And with that, the world can move forward. Mankind can move forward. Uh, it's not a one-time thing. Uh, teshuva is something that we all need to be able to to do in our lives. We all have done something to someone that we regret that we shouldn't have done, that we know we shouldn't have done. And as difficult as it might be, and as painful as it might be, we we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to that other person, and we owe it to our Creator to make amends, to come clean, and to not simply say, I'm sorry, I did it, but I'm sorry, I did it, and it will never happen again. And that's what happens happened in last week's Parsha, and that really is the, the I say, the climax, I think, of the book of Genesis. That's what we've been waiting for all these generations. And now that the fourth generation following Avram has reunited, 
through this amazing, amazing gift of teshuva that Hashem has given us, which is an integral part of free will, because we can't wrong somebody without free will, and we can't right our wrong without free will. It's all part and parcel of that amazing gift that uh, makes us stand out from all creation. So this was a very, very necessary uh, process. Now, it's interesting that throughout the entire saga of Yosef and his brothers, there's no direct contact between Hashem and any of the brothers. You know, uh, God spoke to Avraham, uh, and he spoke to Yitzchak, and he spoke to Yaakov. He spoke to Yaakov in dreams and in night visions. And you would think that, okay, so he's going to speak to the next generation. No. And I, I feel that the reason that God does not speak to the brothers, not that they didn't need his... He could have helped them. He could have helped them solve their issues from the very get-go. But doing tshuva is on us. We need to do it. God can't help us to right our wrongs. God can't help us to to approach someone who we've wronged and, and, and ask for forgiveness and, and be certain never to do it again. That's on us. On the other hand, Yosef, who also was never directly contacted by God, he understood throughout his entire life that there is a God in the world and God was behind everything. I mean, who who solved the the dream interpretation? Now he always said it was it was God, it was Elohim, it was God, it wasn't him. And I think that's the flip side of teshuva, because not only do we need to know how to ask for forgiveness, but we need to know how to forgive. And that's not also not so easy. Someone's done you something wrong, and it's hard to say, okay, I forgive, put it behind me. It's it's in the past, it's done, it's over, it's finished. Not so simple. And if it's only about us, it's it's nearly impossible. Only when we understand that we are also but a subject of Hashem and that there's a God in the world, something much bigger than us, and there's a bigger story going on, and we're not everything, then we have the ability to to forgive. So I think that is, is the important lesson um, that we learn in Parshat Vayigash. And now in Parshat Vayichi, um, uh, Yaakov's going to die. He gathers all his sons together, uh, gives them all blessings. The blessings are very interesting. Of course, he said he was going to reveal to him the end of days, and uh, it doesn't seem to quite happen. So it's a subject that our sages talk about a lot, what happened uh, he all of a sudden the Shechina they say the the presence of Hashem left him and his his understanding of what would happen in the end of days also left him so he was left simply with blessings of his twelve sons but what we gather all along in the background as I said before is that Yosef's status and power in Egypt is waning. Um, you know, he was the right-hand man of Pharaoh. He, Pharaoh said whatever, you know, he told his people, you do what Yosef says. And now Yosef seems to be having to ask for Pharaoh's permission every step of the way. And when he wants to ask for permission to b bury his father in Canaan, in the Machpelah, it says he goes to the house of Pharaoh and asks the people there to, to talk to Pharaoh. All of a sudden, he's distanced from Pharaoh. Okay, so we're already feeling the onset of what's going to happen when we, what we're going to find out what happens when we begin the book of, of Exodus, which is, of course, that um, somehow the favored status of Yosef um, diminished in his own lifetime. And certainly after that, a pharaoh arose who did not know Yosef, and we'll be talking about what that means uh, next week when we begin the book of Exodus but already the 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 galut the the uh, the galut the being outside of the land of Israel the diaspora uh, has set in 
and it's going to be a rocky, rocky couple of hundred years ahead of Israel. And as wonderful as this reunion between the brothers and the father Yaakov is, um, it's tinged with this uh, sense of not merely sadness, but it, it's it's almost depressing. Uh, you know, like all of a sudden they're 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 in galuts, they're in exile, and pretty not pretty soon or pretty soon they're going to be uh, enslaved, because ultimately that is the fate of Israel when in exile. Israel's a free people in her own land. Outside of the land, uh, we're always on borrowed time. There are good times. There are good uh, eras in uh, in the history of the, the Jewish diaspora, the Jewish exile, but uh, even the best of times have always ended up uh, uh, as the worst of times. And uh, I, you know, today the the big uh, golden uh, diaspora is, of course, the United States. And what's happening in the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Jewish population there is not sympathetic right now in many, many levels. It's not just the ugliness that we see in the streets but uh, even in many, many walks of officialdom in the United States, Jews are being uh, filtered out. And uh, the great uh, influence and, um, and contribution that Jews have made to the United States in all different walks of life uh, may be... Uh, at risk of continuing. So um, I certainly don't know the future, but um, I think that if we can gather anything from our history, that there are certain signs that we're seeing now in the United States that uh, may be telling our Jewish brethren in the United States that it's time to, like uh, ya Yaakov did, pick up your feet and come to the land of Israel. Don't wait. Uh, till you're on your deathbed to do so. Um, so that is another lesson that we can glean from this these final chapters of the book of of ex of, of uh, Genesis. And after Yosef and his brothers bury their father Yaakov. All of a sudden, the brothers realize, okay, our father's gone. Uh, what's going to stop Yosef from getting retribution on us? You know, maybe he's been holding back all this time. And Yosef, of course, assures them that that's not the case. He repeats again, this is all God's plan. It's all for the good. And then um, the final verses of the book of Genesis, in chapter 50, verse 22, Yosef dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Yosef lived 110 years. Yosef saw three generations through Ephraim. Even the sons of Machir, son of Menasheh, were raised on Yosef's knees. Yosef said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov. Then Yosef adjured the children of Israel, saying, When God will indeed remember you, then you must bring my bones up out of here. And of course they did that as well. He was buried ultimately in Shechem, and his tomb is a visited to this day. And final verses, Yosef died at the age of 110 years. They embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So the final verse in the book of Genesis is about death in Egypt. A very ominous close to the wonderful book of Genesis. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.